Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of the Thriving Adoptees podcast. And today have we got a treat for you. I always say that and it's always true. Um, we're going to do this in a slightly different way. So I'm joined today by Ashley and, and, and Kayla. And um, they have their, their, their podcasters too. They run an adoption podcast and it's called Adoption Is. And we're going to be running this uh, this pod podcast on, on both of our platforms. So it'll be a slightly different vibe, listeners, if you're used to this. So um, uh, Ashley and Kayla, could you introduce yourself to the listeners, please? Oh, yeah. I'm Ashley. I'm 36 years old. I am a birth mom. I made a placement for my youngest child almost six years ago. Yeah. And uh, Kayla? I'm Kayla. I'm 31. I'm Ashley's life partner, and I'm the daughter of an adoptee. Yeah. So we've got some interesting dynamics going on. So for the for the listeners on adoption is that haven't heard of me, um, I'm Simon Ben. I'm a lot older than you two lovely ladies. I'm uh, I'm 56, right? Um, and I'm a I, I'm an adoptee and a, and a and a podcast. My podcast is called Thriving Adoptees. Um, so what what I, th I thought that this would be a really interesting uh, dynamic because uh, there is uh, the most of the guests that have been on Thriving Adoptees are, are, are older um, and they are you know they're they're um, adoptees adopted parents have some birth mums on but a lot a lot of them have written written books and so they uh, they have processed their stuff. And uh, we want to bring, but we want to bring lots of different perspectives to the Thriving Adoptees podcast. And that's why I'm, I'm keen, so keen to, to explore this stuff with, with you guys to, today. So um, what, out of what you've seen so far and what you've continued to see, what, what sort of themes do, do you think unify the people across the adoption um, uh, constellations are, are there any, you've, 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 you use the word complexity and um, what what is it that you're you're learning as you dip your toe into podcasting and um, meet new people um within the adoption community i would say one thing that there's a lot of unification over is that's the word trauma um i've interviewed a few people who will describe their adoption as a very pleasant, happy, loving, but still primarily focus on the word adopt, um, adoption trauma. And I don't think there's quite as enough awareness or education out there regarding the trauma, or if there is not available until after choices and decisions are made. Yeah. W what about you, Kayla, what do you what do you see? What do you see as the as the themes that that you keep on bumping into? Mm, I think the thing I've most recently seen is the lack of awareness on everybody. Like the adoptees are saying, you know, I can't even find out who my birth parents were. The adoptee and parents are trying to keep it secretive a lot of the times because they don't want their neighbors to be aware of it because of like, especially in America, there's a big shame culture for no reason. And then, you know, the birth parents is even worse for a lot of the time where you feel like you can't even talk about it because it's like, am I taking away the relationship with the new parents? Yeah. It's like, you shouldn't have to sacrifice your relationship with your baby. Yeah, you know, it's that's what I'm seeing. It's just the lack of awareness, just keeping it really closed and secretive. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm a. I, I was uh, adopted through a a, um, a closed adoption back in 1967. So yeah, things were very secretive. And um, so here in the here in the UK, all the adoption records got opened up. Sorry, this is adoption records in in England. So. Uh, England has the kind of the jurisdiction, uh, uh, you know, um, in terms of open records all across England. I'm not quite sure what's different in um, uh, uh, Wales and uh, Scotland, but all those records opened up in 1975. 
And my mum told me fairly recently that that was quite scary for her because when that when when they adopted me and my little sister, um, and that, that was a couple. Of, they adopted her a couple of years after they adopted me. They they were told that nobody would know um, unless they told them. Uh, but then, obviously, between 1967 and 1975, the records had uh, had opened up. My parents did uh, did did tell me. They they told me um, when we were going to collect my sister. So when when I was about two. Uh, yeah, so this the, the secrecy it, it is a common thread, and but obviously different these days. Right, so mm. you you actually talked about uh, the, your place in your um, your your son, and there's still a lot of back and there's the, there's continues to be back and forth. So it would you describe it then as as open and open adoption? Yeah, yeah. Um, all the way up until he was about a two years old we saw each other um sometimes twice a week was probably the average um now that he's a little bit older and involved in some school activities and has an older sister that's involved in a lot of activities too it's probably now like more like once a month but i would say that's like very common especially compared to you know um older adoptions where that was never even an option or an idea yeah it's incredible so hopefully the 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 openness will lessen the trauma um that's my understanding of it um i can see that a lot because i'm parent to older children as well so they lost a brother through the adoption and i see the benefit mainly in the sibling group like they're able to play and grow and get to know each other and greet each other with like brother and sister terms and there's no shyness about it. For example, um, their adoptive brother came to uh, my oldest's birthday party and he had a bunch of friends from school and he was got a chance to explain to his friends like, hey, this is my brother. He just lives with another family. And there was like, that was really sweet watching because there was some confusion. They were like, so you mean that's your cousin? And he's like, no, it's not my cousin. It's my actual brother. And then he was even frustrated and was like, Look, it's just complicated and they just accepted that and there was just this sense of openness but he didn't he doesn't have that pause to say anything he went straight into explaining it and hadn't his physical brother there with them explaining it and that was just really interesting to get to see because i i'm like is this okay to talk about? Like, how are people going to react? Like, what is going to be said to me? And I have to think about that. But since the adoption was open for all of the children's lives, they they don't have that pause. Yeah. And it's really easy for them to talk about it in a lot of situations. And I think that's benefit because they have gotten to grown up with not just knowing of him, but with him. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, 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 a, a strange kind of parallel thing came to, to my mind in terms of uh, how, you know, generally speaking, how open kids are. Right. Yeah. You know, they're, they're, they're less phased by this. And we, and, and I, I, people talk a lot about resilience and bouncing back from setbacks, right? Um, in in, um, uh, in 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 with kids and in with us adults as well. And I feel that um, whatever the opposite of resilience is, so let's say fragility, I would say that that often that's learned. So I, I saw this kid in a in a supermarket. Um, with his mum, and he tripped and fell over, or was running and did it, and he and he and he and he fell over, and he wasn't particularly bothered about the fact that he'd fallen over, right? But then he, but then I saw him look at his mum, and I saw the 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 concern on his mum's face about whether the uh, her, her son had, um, you know, scuffed his knee or something, and um, and and her. So she, her, her face was a, a 
a picture of distress, right? And he picked up on that. He 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 kind of he th there was nothing wrong until he saw his mum's face, and yeah. then he was concerned. Like th there was nothing wrong with with falling over. There was no harm done, right? Um, and so he he was at, but then he he got upset because he saw his mum was upset, and it's almost as if kids learn fragility. You know that they, they are inherently resilient they they bounce back when they're little you know they they don't they, it, it, when kids fall over when they're learning to to walk it's oh i've just fallen over yeah um so they seem in some ways to be wiser than us adults when we do we've we we uh well, speaking for myself here really in terms of overthinking stuff and 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 getting learned so um does that make any sense it does. Um, I like so the word adoption we talk about it quite a bit in our household. And like in fact, I go to a support group and the children they have childcare, so they go with me there and they know why we're there. Um and they have no no pause or shame of it, but like when we're discussing like ideas or like um episodes and like because there's a lot of emotions that we have to unpack and a lot of ideas that I haven't thought about before when it comes to adoption come forth sometimes the kids as much as I would like them to not be aware of the negative sides they are aware because they, they can hear me even when I think they can't <laughs> yeah, yeah. and I've seen some of their comments and opinions and emotions they're coming forth and maturing too as well and I think that you know like we were saying it's like a learned behavior I don't want to like really feel like I'm I try to not shape their mind as unbiasedly as possible but I can see how having a topic so open and openly discussed as like right and wrong good and bad and just different things of emotions that I've been experiencing at different times how that has affected their thoughts and opinions as well yeah. growing up so it'd be interesting to see what right now their relationship is very unpaused it's very organic it's very out there in the open but how it would i don't know i've not really thought about that until right now but like how it'll change over time and develop yeah. i i think um we have to uh, kid, kids are so sensitive they pick up on they pick up, up on so much and uh, I, me and my wife haven't got any kids, right? Um, but what I hear from other people that have got kids is that kids do do as we do, not as we say. So they they they're, they're modelling, they're modelling us, they're copying us, um, and and copying what what we what we do, not what we say. And they they that they have a, an inbuilt kind of. Uh, radar a sensitivity within them that 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 sees the truth far easily than mm -hmm. than we do, and they they see the truth in in our words. And if there's a mismatch between our words and our deeds, they always go with our deeds, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, you know this uh, shame thing for me. Uh, yeah, shame, shame and trauma do seem to be the the biggest, and secrecy do seem to be the the biggest themes uh, around. Um, and people talk a lot about attachment, don't they, as well? You know, we, it, it it seems to me that if I look in the adult adoptee groups on Facebook. Uh, I, I see a, a lot of people in a lot of pain, and a, and a lot of a, a lot of people who's um, ha hanging on to a diagnosis. So th this this thing people call about the prime the primal wound, right? The the the, the um, separation, the trauma on the back of separation from the birth mother. People talk. I I, I look at the trauma. I. I Spent a lot of time thinking about the primal wound, um, and reading the book actually took me down. 
right? So I, um, it, 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 it clarified what was happening on one level, but it also, it, it kept me stuck. I felt stuck. So it, was, it wasn't something because it was a primal wound that had happened however many years ago. So I was reading when I was probably 48 or something like that. So it happened 48 years ago. So it was something that I felt I was stuck with. Um, so there was a relief in the diagnosis at one level. And, and then there was a, th then there was a, 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 a some disease that I, I felt like it was something that I was stuck with, but luckily that didn't last, last too long. I kind of realized it was in, for, for me, it was, um, it, it wasn't something that defined who I was it was an event that happened to me it was a um uh, it was a belief in my head i didn't believe that i was wounded until i read the primal wound so for me it was a it, 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 i talked about my my primal wound being like a a, sh a sharp a sort of like a like a paper cut and some some primal wounds seem to be like more like a a shark bite, you know, somebody's taking a chunk out of the way, far bigger, mm -hmm. um, bigger and, and, and deeper. Um, so what I, what I see in the adoptee community is, is a lot of people within a lot of, a lot of pain and very trauma focused. And I see within the, uh, the adoption, let's call it an industry, right? The adoption industry, like uh, adoptive parents and adoption agencies, I see a lot of a, a, a lot of people focusing on trauma uh, uh, as well. So I, I see everybody being, to to a lesser or greater extent, trauma obsessed. Right? Whereas I I I'm I advocate approach. I believe in an approach that's trauma informed. And hope obsessed, or trauma informed, and and healing obsessed. Let's focus on what we need to do. Uh, let's focus. Yeah, let's focus on what we need to do to, you know, Bruce. Have you read the Bruce Perry book uh, with Oprah? Have you read that one? Um, it it's it, it's it's not it's something like it's not wrong it's not what's wrong with you it's what happened to you and it, it, it's a story it's not all about adoption but it's it's about trauma on a more general level but he keeps on saying they keep on saying trauma you know trauma 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 and then they say ah but there's this thing called neuroplasticity um and uh, so that gives us hope but it doesn't go into any more detail than that other than saying there is some hope right uh, and like doesn't say well neuroplasticity is about having a change of heart or about having a, a, a change of heart or a change of mind and it so it, it's about having an insight it's about seeing something new they they don't they don't it doesn't demystify it it, it, it shrouds it all in the oh, neuroplasticity what you know what on earth is that well that that's having a that, that's having a new idea. That's having a belief busted, or that, that's not seeing, um, that's seeing something new. Um, what what do you think of this kind of? Uh, 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 what's your philosophy, you guys, uh, Ashley and Kayla, on 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 this? Do you think that we're do you think that we're trauma obsessed? Do you think that's just how how I'm? Do you think that's just my Simon's opinion? Oh, and that's what is really interesting. I'm like taking all of what you just said in, and my head's going like a mile yeah. a minute here because like I said quite really a lot. interesting ideas. Um, I I can definitely see the point of trauma obsess. I think that obsession comes from initially not knowing, like not being informed, okay. uh, and then that shock from it afterwards, like when it comes to a birth story like there's so many things that we take for granted like i took for granted like that my parents were my parents and you know so it's just hard 
when you're over here making a placement plan, like for me as a birth mom, <clears throat> to not be aware of what I've taken for granted that my son won't have. So for example, I didn't know about the primal ruined, what you're talking about, that separation anxiety. I didn't know about that until he was around three years old. So I was like three years post to make it a placement plan. <clears throat> and I saw it on, well, I didn't even see it on Facebook. One of my friends saw it on Facebook who I had also made a placement plan. And she was taken as shocked by it and told me about it. And I was like, that was like an idea that I didn't even occur of because I, I was like, but he's a baby. Like, <clears throat> so then I also went down the path of becoming obsessed with it. And I was kind of like, what did I do? Because I wasn't even aware. So there was like this initial shock of finding out about a trauma that existed and having a name and a place and like where my ideas are coming from and you know actually being able to point my finger at it and saying this is it so I became obsessed with it definitely afterwards and then that led to a lot of like right or wrong thinking and we're humans like nobody's life story fits into a checkbox so there's no when it comes to right or wrong it's just it's like how can there be because there's no checkbox that you just check this is right this is wrong and it's just so complicated so murky everybody's situation is like so i definitely like where you're going on it's like all right we know about the trauma instead of being obsessed about like exploring what this trauma is even further what are the ways of coping with it and moving on and not like forgetting but like living with and coping and yeah surviving and thriving yeah but you see you're doing that by the way that you're doing you're navigating the open adoption you're you're doing that like I, I don't think I think in in the Western world we're very good at overthinking, right? Yes. <laughs> and, 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 and we're not very good at taking compliments. And we're not we're not very good at taking compliments, and we're we're not we're not good at seeing our own strengths, right? So all the stuff that you're already doing, the way that you're doing it, is is you know like well whatever primal if if the primal wound has happened for your son right and i spoke to a transracial adopter yesterday from el salvador and it, it he's the first person that's ever said, come on the show and said he didn't feel a primal wound right? and he's from el salvador mm -hmm. um uh, but uh, adopted into uh, the, the 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 us grew up in the states um similar age to me a bit younger i think um so but that that it that is done right so what if, if the, the that trauma has if it, it's been and it, it, it's been and gone if it, it, it or it's already occurred if it, right if, if it's occurred so what you're doing now in terms of um minimizing the uh, being being so open about the adoption you're minimizing the post any post placement trauma and so we we separate these two things into different strata of trauma right so we talk about um relinquishment trauma and adoption trauma right so lose losing the mum and, and 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 gaining the new family shock and gaining the new family but we look at them for the sake of conversation but your son is your son. You, you, you don't, you can't divide him into two bits. Right. The, the two things come together and are playing. So by, you know, when you say, no, oh, we see him, I used to see him twice a week. And I'm like, what? <laughs> <laughs> um, it, I, I, it's, it's totally blown away. So what, what you're doing and, and this openness and this trust, then that's, that's got to be the way because it, it, it's got to be the way forward because we're 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 um we're, we're minimizing any shame we're bringing 
uh, we're bringing this stuff into the open so we can have a look at it and we and it's not so scary anymore right so it's like um sorry a bit of a kiddie analogy which popped into my head you know like we're putting this we're, we're putting a switch on the light and then we're looking under the bed to see there's no monsters there right yeah yeah definitely um i know it's, this is like bringing me some flashbacks and some conversations i had with the agency when i was making the placement plan because <laughs> i hadn't heard of an open adoption term like you know as far as like open like I don't know. I just didn't even have a concept of what that would even mean. So and naturally I was like, well, I kind of wanted to close adoption because like that's all I had never heard of. And they were explaining to me about like how this was going to be the best for my child and to help. Um, they didn't talk about the trauma at all, but they were, yeah, I think they used the words like adapt and grow and thrive and like just words like that. And I was like, okay, I can get on board with that. But I had a lot of fear and hesitation about it. Um, I mean, it's scary because like every day I'm going to wonder like if when we're meeting, like is there going to be like some big question? Is there going to be some anger lashed out at me? Um, the two children I'm parenting, what are there going to be thoughts as they visit with their brother but not live with him? Like, are they going to... So I was like afraid of being questioned by my children. So I had this real fear of it being open for that reason, but um, they had a lot of experience with open adoptions. That was all this agency support. So they were explaining, I was expressing that they were like, well, when it's from the very beginning, it's usually a lot really organic and there isn't these surprise conversations. You, you're there to witness those emotions developing and addressing them and talking about it and just having this continuous conversation. And I really just took her, took them at faith that that's what was really going to happen. So far it has been. Yeah. Yeah. Well, but um, Kayla, you talked about the shock of, of, of your, um, one of your parents. What was the story yeah, again? My mom. Your mom? So the 60s scoop was like kids that were being kind of like not so legally adopted but the adopting parents never do it was like the agencies and the birth parents didn't really know just the agencies kind of knew what they were up to and she was at the middle of that in 1964 and there was like no open adoptions here at that point and so what they told my grandma, so this is what I'm going back to, I'm more of a science person. So with, I don't think that you can be too trauma obsessed because the more you know about it, like you're eventually going to find what you were looking for. And then you're going to just like have what you need to help other people oh. maybe because like what they told my grandma and grandpa, they were like, never let them know that they're not yours biologically. It's going to mess them up forever. So my grandma was like to her deathbed being like, it doesn't matter that you're adopted you were always mine and that didn't really help because my aunt found the papers in the basement in a flood and then called my mom with all three of us her really small kids over and like literally she was walking to the door she was like so you want to explain these adoption papers that I found and that's how my mom found out it wow. was really terrible and that could have yeah. never happened if everybody knew what they were doing back then or like was actually talking about it because it would have been the complete opposite. They would have been like, make sure they know that they were adopted. And yeah. maybe it would have been great, but it was not great. And she was scared for years to even see if she could find the agency. And then once we found it, um, I wanted her to call them to try to get her record unsealed. And she found out they could only do that if her birth parents were both dead. So she had to petition the state of Wisconsin just to get that information. And then the dad was never listed because the mom was keeping him a secret because it was 1964 and it was illegal to have a baby to anyone that wasn't your husband then. And she found out through that paperwork that it was a state forced adoption because of that. And she got really bitter because when we looked it up like several years later, that wasn't even a law anymore. And she had no way of ever contacting her birth mom before she died. 
and she had to go do all these DNA tests to find some cousins and stuff online, but didn't even know she existed. Yeah. Yeah. So I like this, the whole thing about, you know, I say, I, I don't, I, I can't say any um, simpler than, you know, nobody likes sharks. Like, <laughs> yeah, especially like that. Like this is, uh, uh, and then the, then you add on the kind of the fight with the legal system, you know, and and the and 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 the emotional stuff that uh, the emotional focus I think that could be in on that um, could be focusing in on that healing that emotional stuff it it gets on it gets focused on fighting the system. Yeah, and then once that and, was done with still a fight once that was done yeah. with it's still a fight because now like she didn't know anything she was didn't even real she doesn't even i don't even think my mom accepts that it's a possibility to have trauma over someone you never met and it's so hard for her still and she's in her mid-50s yeah you know well, but she's... i'm feeling like if she knew like if everybody in every state of every country knew then it couldn't even be a secret or a shameful thing anymore yeah so i I mean, not getting obsessed with it, but, you know, trying to heal yourself through the information, I think, would be a better use of people's time yeah. than just kind of obsessing over the primal wound idea. Yeah. I think I kind of latched on to the primal wound idea. And what I see is, you know, it, it's, a, it's a metaphor, right? Yeah. It's, 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 it's a, what is the primal wound? It's a metaphor. It, it's, a, it's a diagnosis. It's, it's a belief you know what is it okay so in, in other parts of in other parts of the kind of uh, personal development world right we people talk about busting self-limiting beliefs well i i didn't believe i was primarily wounded in so like, like am i you know th this transracial adoptee um uh, transracial adoptee uh, yesterday he he was um he was he was he was bipolar as well. And two doctors, had, the first two doctors had seen, that had seen him and said he wasn't bipolar. And the third one said he was, right? So it, it's an opinion. You look at, look at you, you look at, um, uh, it, 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 at one level, it's an opinion. Like, according to that, you know, I looked at something years ago for, um, uh, a, um, uh, a, a a description for uh, depression, a, a list of things for depression, and there were ten, there was ten of them, and I thought, well, I could tick all of those. Do I think I'm depressed? No, I don't think I'm depressed. Do I do I look like I'm depressed to you? Do I you know like no. <laughs> um, it, it's like some of this stuff is uh, it is you. Some of these diagnoses are, yeah, a bit tricky. So, yeah, I think it goes back to like standardization. You know, like we want to standardize, like, this is what a depressed person looks like, or this is what a bipolar or the primal wound looks like. So, here's this checklist. But when all standardization there's always discrimination that follows because not everybody fits into a checklist they might not have any of the boxes checked and still identify that way as like hey i'm still struggling with depression or other various things and so it's just the fact that you know it's like we're humans and we need to accept the fact that a simple list it's just there to guide, not to yeah. diagnose. So yeah, um, I, it, my take is this: is is that the adoption world has gone, um, or it, it swung, you know, from from rainbows and unicorns to this trauma stuff. And I, yeah, I don't think we can know too much about the the trauma and you know if if i've got if i've got two hours 
to read a book or you know if i've got if if i if i if i can only read two books i'd like to read one on on trauma and one on healing do you see what i mean i'm, I'm yeah. not I, 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 but I, I wouldn't want to read just one on healing. I sorry, just two on healing or just two on trauma. I'd, I'd, I'd like to get a balanced. I'd like to get a, a, a kind of like a balanced uh, approach on it. And I, but I want to. I, I, I want to learn from. So this is this in it, it, this happened to me in the adoption space, right? So. I, I found this group on Facebook and it was called uh, Adoptee Influences. And I thought, oh, that'd be great. That'll be people that have been through some stuff like I have. And, and my stuff is pretty low, you know, like a, it's a paper cut rather than a sharp bag. So I've been through some stuff and I've learned some stuff through some stuff and I continue to learn stuff. So I'm I'm consuming podcasts and, and audios like two hours a day when I'm walking when I'm walking the dog in the morning when I'm driving in the car, I'm, yeah I'm I'm obsessed <laughs> I'm healing I'm obsessed I'm healing yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm obsessed. Um, uh, and um, where was I going with that? So yeah, the adoptee influencer group I thought that'd be great. So that this will be people that have been through some stuff come out the other side or, or coming out on the other side and, and, and realize that learning is a lifelong journey. Healing is a lifelong journey at one level. Um, and and um, so I think, great. And so I joined the group and I put it, and I read this long, long post from an adoptee. It's pretty dark, um, but some very valid points. And I said at the end, uh, so I, the, but I was expecting some light at the end of the tunnel, right? So I put a, I, I asked a question, and, and then I got about, you know, I said, great article. Is there any light at the end of the tunnel, whatever? And um, he, they, they came back to me and, and, and uh, answered it. And then, and I answered it back. And then I realized that I had inverted my, my questioning uh, in this Facebook group had um, caused some inadvertent uh, upset. I, I, and I was, they accused me of uh, toxic positivity, right? And I thought, oh dear, I've not, I didn't set it. I didn't, I, I, I came to the group to, to swap ideas, to learn from people and share opinions, share perspectives. I didn't come down, I didn't come here to upset anybody, but I've upset somebody. So I deleted my comments and, and I was on the way out of my group, out of this group. And then somebody put, it, it, there was a sneer, a sneery comment saying, He's not, he's, he's not even sure of his own arguments. He's deleted the comment. You know, what an idiot, or words to that effect, right? And um, I thought, I, I thought, well, I'm not gonna go in and answer that, but that's not, that's not the story. I, I, I deleted my comments, not because I'm not sure of what I said, but because I, I've inadvertently caused upset. So, you know, I'm, these are adoptee influences and I'm, and I, you know, like I've had people on the show that have been mentors in the adoption space and then told me after we finished recording that, that they're starting uh, therapy next week. And I thought, wrong way round. Wrong way round. You do the therapy first and then you go out and help others. You don't want to, you don't, you don't want to, nobody, if you have an open heart surgery, right, you wouldn't want a trainee, you, want a, you wouldn't want a trainee surgeon, would you? The training, yeah. 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 I was thinking about, I was thinking about something similar as you've been talking. I agree. I think that your final stages of healing or anything, like any healing journey that you're on, but especially something that goes all the way back to the day that you were born. It isn't just like accepting it. It's being able to help other people learn how to help themselves deal with it because they're not dealing with it like you are. And that's one of the reasons I really like doing this podcast and being on your podcast. Yeah. I get the feeling I'm talking too much, though. <laughs> oh, no, I'm no, loving it, too. True. No, I mean, you're... Well, you're it's so interesting. You it is. You, you have a lot of ideas. So I'm over here like, interesting, interesting. Like, I'm going to think about that. I mean, it brought me some flashbacks to um, about, like, what you were saying about therapy and training. 
Um, so I'm still really close with the agency, obviously, because I could go through a support group and I have a lot of friends there. Um, there's been a few people I've met that came at it with like a, what I believe they thought was a really positive and good heart, but they didn't have the therapy to heal their wounds. And that came out a lot in their work in dealing with something serious as like making a life changing plan for a child. And it was like, yeah, the wrong way of going about it. Like there should be, I don't know. And now I'm just thinking like, should there be like required self-work done to be in the industry? Yeah. Like if you're going to be a counselor, should you have to be licensed? Things like that. Yeah. Well, the, the, um, the, the most impactful moments for me is, is that self-work worth piece, self-work piece. So, um, there's, I, I, this is the most out of the 200 odd 80 episodes I've, uh, I've done. So I did some uh, earlier on, I did a lot of, um, interviews with adoptive parents and adoption professionals. And most of them were both. Most of them were adopted moms who run agencies. And what there's a episode by a, a, a mum of nine uh, from, from uh, Texas called Holly Ann Petrie. She has nine, nine kids, six of them, three of them biological, six of them are through, through, um, through adoption. And she came up with her she was the first person that ever came up with a, um, a topic for the conversation that, that we had on the podcast. And it was healing our own wounds as adoptive parents. No, it didn't. No, it wasn't. Sorry. It was unpacking our own baggage as adoptive parents. And, and, I, I, and, and the, that, self, that self-knowledge piece, that self-work piece uh, seems to be the part you know it's the it's the thing so we can't um on the other side you know some uh licensed counsel counselors um you mentioned licensed uh Kate, Kayla um they get called by adoptive parents and the and the usually moms and and the general gist of the of the first phone conversation is fix my kid And she has to turn it around. No, it's about your ability to not take your kid's trauma personally, essentially. It's about your own grounding. It's being, yeah. being able to give space, hold space for your child, not go, not go off the rails when your kid's going off the rails. You know that that's what it seems to me. So that that's one of been the 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 biggest things for me that self self awareness piece. And you know, like and having read like books on emotional intelligence, it always starts with us, right? The, the, there's four there's four quadrants in emotional intelligence, and the first one is 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 ourselves. And the other big thing for me has been the um the uh, the three, four, now five, six birth moms I've had on the show. Um, and the, the, the level of thought and um, lack of selfishness that's gone in to making the, to, to making the birth plan. Um, had a fantastic lady on the show from Canada who's a birth mom who now runs an agency. Oh. And, and, and knows her son, her 35 year old son, lives around just around the corner. Don't see him quite as often as, as, as you see your, your son, but, he, but they're right around the corner at 35 years on, that's still happening. And you think that's what we should be going for, that kind of self knowledge it starts with us and harmony mm -hmm. like 
how often do we hear that word? <laughs> I've never I've never used that word harmony in a in a podcast conversation before. But that's what we should be going for, isn't it? We want harmonious environment, we want harmonious relationship. We want an end. We want an end to the end to the 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 drama and the and the and the and the trauma. And we want the, the what's best for everybody. Yeah. I mean, with adoption, the whole idea is for the child to have the best life possible. I mean, I would say that's like probably the main reason that as birth moms cope with. Um, and that's just from the few I know. I, but I would say that that would be a pretty common thing there. So, I mean, I was asked a question by, I think it was like her second interview with a lady. Um, She's like, well, if the adoptee isn't doing well, none of this was worth it. And I, that really hit me hard because then it put a lot of pressure. I was like, well, it needs to do well because I need to make sure this is worth it. Because I, I, that's a lot to risk. Like for me, it's like, yeah, I mean, it's such a big decision, and I don't want it to be risked and to see like oh, I don't know how to phrase this like somebody that's not equipped with managing life to be raised from that decision. Yeah. You know, I mean, I want it to be what what was promised a better life like I want to see the benefits of the better life I want to see thriving and okayness so it put a lot of pressure on me I was like I really need to make sure I'm there and I know you're talking about how like I'm a very open adoption but I from my close-knit friends I don't feel like I'm as open as some others um we have an episode that's coming out next um but the lady, as I was interviewing her, she was actually holding her son because he had tubes put in his ears and they needed somebody, you know, to help him with the aftercare while they were working and doing their things. So the birth mom was watching her son and she has quite a few overnights with him weekly and has always, and including extended family members having really detailed relationships with them and they're Harmonious was just such a great word of describing how she described it as loving. Uh, but basically the idea was like they had agreed the more to love their child, the better everything will be. And to make it worth it that this is going that we're going through that, you know, the loss of um, losing your child, relinquishment trauma, and then the primal wound trauma, all those to make it worth it. And I'm over here like man I need to step up my game <laughs> like wow. I need to be more available like what's going on like and I've I had a lot of pressure about that so I've been thinking about that a lot too like what is the best approach like and I've also thought about um how little we knew about grief and still little know about grief or how well it's talked about like we know the cycle of grief and everything but like how many people are out there able to identify that they're going through a grieving process right then? I wasn't able to identify that I had grief over the adoption until my child was five. That was the first time I cried about it. But I mean, very he was always, recent. yeah, very recent, like he's five and a half now. But I've always been present in his life. So it was really hard for me to recognize that I was I still went through grief. So I wasn't even aware of my own trauma. Yeah. Until then. So like, and it's just so many ideas are coming at me and, and like what feels authentic to my situation, what feels like it applies that varies at different times. Yeah. Well, I, I'm I, I'm um, I'm struggling with this comparisonitis stuff too, right? The comparisonitis it seems to be. Um, we've had a pandemic, but you know, uh, yeah. comparisonitis is is a is an epidemic, isn't it, in the Western world? And, and 
social media just exacerbating and stuff like that um and until we see something differently right so i was talking about this yesterday on the podcast uh i was comparing my number of downloads with somebody else's downloads in the adoption podcast uh, and the friend i was talking to a fellow adoptee he said well i, I think you get it I think you're getting the the quality of your impact uh, mixed up with the quantity of the other podcast, and 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 then and that litter, sorry, <clears throat> that 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 helped me see something that a mentor of mine has been helping me try to see for about ten years. The fact that I'm doing it the way that I want to do it, I'm doing it as as, as what feels right for me. Um, right. And um, I, I think that we end up comparing, or we end up doing stuff, until we see something better. We until we have an insight. This is why I was going on about neuroplasticity. Okay, so so Bruce Perry, so what's neuroplasticity? Well, it's having a new idea. Yeah. It's seeing something new. The guy said to me, the, you know, in, in a conversation, Vince said to me, I think you're getting confused, Simon. And and I it sort it, it helped me see. So now I don't worry about that uh, 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 as much or if at all. I'm I'm happy having a smaller number of downloads but doing what feels right for me and um you know the the other silly a much silly example came into my head was um i, I do a lot of swimming right there's always somebody that's um faster than me in the swimming pool and there's always people that are slower than me in the swimming pool and and that so that that's just life there'll there'll always be people that are seeing their birth kids less than you and and more than you that yeah it it, it it's always it, it's always going to be that way um and, but you know, like we have to have our own insights. I so this uh, I came up with this about three years ago, and it's the best one of the best lines I've ever come up with. I was talking to um, a, a mate of a friend of my uh, wife. I said, "There's no such thing as a second-hand insight. We have yeah. to have, we have to have the insights for ourselves. You know, if I could if I could help everybody to have the same insight." Well, it seems a bit big headed, really. That's no, but um, um, you know, if I could, if I'm having an event and I'm um, and I'm uh, aware, if I'm doing a webinar, right, so I'm doing the speaking rather than a conversation, I'm I'm trying to help people see something new, but I I can only just use my skills to point at it. I can't actually help. I can't make them see it. They have to. They have to see it for themselves and that for me is you know and, and and how you do that like how you how you work on metaphors stories insights and um, communication um, vulnerability all those things that's the place to that's the place to 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 be, that's the place to explore. You know, yeah. Not just say, uh, well, yeah, there is trauma, but there is neuroplasticity, and that's great. You know, for me, it, the the book I, I read, the I listened to the book, and I listened to eight for it to eight hours, and um, I I kept on thinking, is he going to get to the good bit? Is he going to tell us how to harness neuroplasticity? Is he going to talk about vulnerability is he going to talk about how we share information with people how we help kids see stuff how we how we make kids the um uh, how, how we flip the uh, like if i'm working with kids I, 
like doing them events in in in, in schools and stuff. Um, I I flip the power base. I ask them. I don't expect them to believe what I say. I say, well, do you want me to prove that to you? And they say, yeah. And then, and then I say, well, do you want to share something with the class? So I, I flip the power base, and they 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 love that. Mm -hmm. And and they so I I try to meet the kids um, where they want where they want to be, um, and um, yeah, that's where we should be talking. Not. Not. Yeah, definitely. I mean, that has brought something else to my mind. Um, so we have relatively few downloads as well, but probably a lot less because we have a lot less evidence. We just started all this. Yeah, of course, yeah. Um, we just started all over um, the winter break. So um, we're pretty fresh. Um, but on Instagram, we have a lot larger presence and it doesn't match the downloads. And we, there's been a few negative comments that have came our way, you know, but we're like, I don't think you heard the episode because like what you're saying isn't quite lining up with what's going on, but you're totally entitled to your opinion and thoughts. And that's what we're about. Like, if you want to have an episode to express this, feel free. But um, for example, there's a lot of misunderstanding about how we come up with the titles for our episodes. Um, that is solely on the other person. Um, so the adoption is, what that is, is a, is a sentence, right? And it's dot, dot, dot. So I always, we ask the person, like, how would you complete that sentence? And then everything that the interview covers, we try to relate it back to their belief of how to finish that sentence with given no prompts whatsoever, adoption is. Yeah. And it's like, but that, was chosen because of their life experience, not necessarily a belief that that is how all adoptions should be. All adoptions are a necessary choice, but for that specific situation, that interview, how their situation expressed it, that that's their title and their reasoning. And that's how we're going about it. It's like, I'm trying to see it through so many eyes as possible to form that big picture myself and I'm still really exploring like what are my views of things as I'm like getting more knowledge about it. What are my perceptions over it? You know, I was definitely obsessed over trauma for a while. Like I said, that wasn't even an idea to me until like three years post placement. Yeah. So um, oh. I remember when I found out that adoptive parents can have postpartum depression too, for example. And I was like, at first I was offended. I was like, how can you have postpartum depression? Like you didn't birth the baby. <laughs> like what's going on here? Like that didn't even make sense. And like, it had to be explained to me. And I was like, well, now that I know that and I can see the explanation, like that does make sense. And I can see how that's a concern. And like, I was saying, like, I don't think people know a whole lot about grief. For example, um, initially the, a lot of people were told like, make sure you don't let them know that they were adopted because of bonding. We want you to be able to bond as your own child and have them to feel inclusive in the family and not as an outsider. But we've now learned more, like it goes deeper than just feeling inclusive. Like you can have the feeling of inclusive and belonging to the family and still be aware that the adoption happened. Yeah. And we just know so much more now and mm. yet, how much of it's mainstreamed? Well, not. I mean, the, the 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 thing for me is before I came into the adoption space, I spent seven years um, helping kids understand their feelings mm -hmm. and where they come from. And you know, we we live a, we live in a world. We, I joke about this, right? But we, uh, they, they, I was just over in um, uh, South Carolina a couple of weeks ago doing some um, work in a children's home and in elementary schools, and and I joked about this. You know, do you? So back in the UK, we have this thing called miserable weather, right? We have this thing called. Do you, do you guys have this here in South Carolina? Do you have miserable weather? Do you have this special magic weather that makes people depressed? 
And they're looking. Well, we're in Oklahoma. Place. We have tornadoes. And I did. Stuff. I was in Wisconsin. I did. But down here, it's too sunny and happy. Too sunny and happy, right? Yeah. So um, we, ninety nine point nine percent of the people in the world believe that the weather changes their mood. Well, no, feelings are an inside job. No, yeah. that's so, interesting. Well, like, yeah. and I forget that too, right? Oh, in Oklahoma, oh, no, in Oklahoma, our weather saying is, if you don't like the weather, wait five minutes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Because we have um, a lot of really extreme weather that can happen all yeah. within yeah. a very, very quickly. We have tornadoes. And the winds are so strong here. Yeah. Hail, random winds. And it is stuff. like when you are aware that there's going to be probably a high likelihood of tornado weather, everybody goes to the store to buy snacks. <laughs> So that you have something to eat and do while you're like hiding out in your little safety room, waiting yeah. for the weather to come, and it's but kind of a bonding time for families. Yeah, but there's a different there's a difference between physical there's, there's yeah. a difference between physical danger and emotional danger. There is. I I never really thought about it, like the weather affecting my emotions, but it changes so quickly here. But then again, my emotions yeah, yeah. Well, also maybe, change really quickly. Yeah. But, but but you're but you've got you, you've got a higher degree of self uh, awareness and a higher degree of emotional intelligence, you know. But mo I, I say at the at the swimming pool, I say uh, there's a lady, a volunteer that works at, at the um, the desk where you check in and show your membership card. And say to, I say to her, "How are you doing?" She said, "Oh, as good as the weather." She believes she believes that the weather causes her mood, and most people in the Britain think that, right? So um, we're up in Scotland, they say, wait five minutes. The west coast of Scotland, they say, wait five minutes because the weather will change you if you don't like it. Um, and so, so if we're going to be educating our kids, adopted kids, birth kids, foster kids, whatever, sh shouldn't we be actually t telling them, shouldn't we be coming from a, a place of truth? Because otherwise, it, we, we, they will... They will believe, like most people, that the weather causes their mood. Yeah. But shouldn't we be doing that? That that's where we, should, you know, like, and and where their feelings come from, and like, and also the feelings. You know, one of the things that I, I've been looking, at, you know, I learned about fourteen years ago, and still learn. Right, our feelings aren't our fault. Right, it's not our fault, and. And also, it feels like our feelings can actually engulf us, but they can't. You know. So this is saying that we have a lot in our in our family unit. One of the things that we say a lot is that you're only human. Like, it's okay to have these negative feelings. It's okay to have big feelings because yeah. you're human, and those are human feelings. Um. So. But we don't call them bad feelings. It, but, I say big yeah. feelings. Yeah, yeah. Because um, big feelings, like even over Jovius, you know, but that's, you're human. Those are human feelings. Um, so I like how you're saying like, that's not, I can see how the weather could play effect on your feelings, but you're still human. Those feelings are coming from inside. Yeah, that, but this is the big stuff, right? Yeah. This is the big stuff. And this is like, um, and the other thing is that, um, we aren't our feelings. We're, we're, we're obsessed with our feelings. You know, we're emotophobic. We're scared of emotions. Like the, some shrinks are starting to say this now. Um, you know, we've got a, we've, we've got a psychological uh, community um, where, you know, everything is everything is made into a thing. You know that DSM, this manual, this DSM, which the diagnostic, whatever it is, the manual of disorder, disorders or whatever it's called. It 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 it's got loads more pages in than it used to do. So the 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 the, the pharmaceutical companies pay universities money to discover new syndromes so that they can create new drugs to to do that. To, to to solve these new problems so it's like sometimes sometimes you know like sometimes we just it's just emotional weather sometimes it's 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 nothing more than that but everything 
becomes a thing. You know, like you, you, you're doing a great thing, saying that there's no such thing as bad, um, bad feelings. But we see a lot of stuff. There's a lot of stuff going out there where we're pathologizing feelings, aren't we? Right? And it's, we're like we're making feelings bad, and but we're spending all our time focusing on our thoughts and our feelings. But neither of those two things are who we are. So we like the the for me the the power is it upstream, upstream of our feelings, upstream of our thoughts. And to 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 the the uh, the the spirit consciousness awareness the 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 the, the thing that is a, and it's not a thing that's aware of those thoughts and feelings. Yeah, I run a support group, and we were just talking about big feelings, and that I was like, you got to remember, like you could never cure yourself of ever feeling sad, mad, or angry, yeah. like those are normal and they're going to be part of your identity they're going to be part of your life you're going to experience them over and over and over again and they serve a purpose yeah they're well, important to have well yeah and i i released an episode uh, today have you come across a lady called pamela caranova you come across her yeah have no we? not yet yeah she's <laughs> she's she's a big she's a big she's a big noise in the adopted community she's she's got uh she's got a uh, she leads a nonprofit called Adoptees Connect, and they do face to face, face to face meetings all across the states. And yeah, she's a she's a big deal, and um, and she's she fought her feelings or numbed her feelings with booze. She talks about twenty, I think she's about twenty seven year old, a twenty seven year relationship with booze. You know, it, it her adoption wasn't it didn't go well. Um, and um, she was numbing out on. She was she was numbing out with twenty seven years of uh, relationship with booze because the skit the, the feelings are so big because we're the feelings are yeah because the feelings are so big she was trying to numb them out and that's and, and that led her to alcoholism. So you know we're 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 trying to. We're, we're, we're trying to fight, most of us trying to fight our feelings, numb them out, get rid of them, change them, um, rather than seeing that a, a feeling that we'd rather not have is a sign that we've got some subconscious thoughts that aren't the truth there. It's like there the, are the rumble strips. You have rumble strips by the side of the uh, by the highway, yeah. So you've got these. Uh, if if you drift off your lane, you hit this juddering. There's this yeah. juddering sound on the tire because so that's the the. It's like a a a, 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 a you, you're colder. So a, a warmer, colder game you play with the kids, right? So a, a bad feeling is a signal that something's. You, you, your mind's going slightly astray. You're wandering off course. So in a way, it, you, you should be grateful for that because that's going to point you back to where you want to be. Uh, um, I sort of feel like that comes down to like ownership. Um, it's much easier to find blame or place blame or displace your anger instead of having ownership of like, hey, I'm having this thought and it's upsetting me. I'm having this feeling and it's upsetting me, like just no, no. ownership. We can blame it on the weather or blame it on the on the line or blame it yeah. on somebody else or blame it on like if you're me, a number of downloads, you know, you can yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um so I'm conscious of time. Uh, um is there anything that you wanna ask me before we before we bring it in? Um, I do. Since um, you've talked a lot about the light at the rainbow, um, I mean the the light at the end of the tunnel. What has what has been some of your your light? Like how what how, how you're coping and thriving. Thriving. 
I'll what has been your process with that? Uh, curiosity, I'd say. And I wouldn't say coping. I, okay. would, say, I would say learning, exploring, being curious. Uh, the, the big thing for me was um, the, the, the biggest thing for me was seeing that none of us are woundable. You know, I, I have felt, I have felt wounded, but my feelings aren't who I am. Who we truly are, there's a place within all of us that is unwoundable, that, that um, spirit, life force, energy, God, um, consciousness, awareness. It's not a thing. And because it's not a thing, it can't be wounded. Mm -hmm. um, our, um, our, uh, have, you, have you seen me or heard me doing the, uh, the, the, the diamond in the fist thing? Have you, have you seen me do I'm that? I've listened to the first two episodes. Yeah, okay. So, so this doesn't work well for a podcast listeners, but um, I'm holding my fist up to the screen, right? And it, and it's so white, so I'm white knuckling it, right? So the the the, the my trauma manifested to a, a, in anger. Twenty seconds of very intense anger towards my birth mom, right? That hit me at forty, and that I'd never that I'd, I'd never felt before, I never realised before, never thought before, right? So it, it, the the trauma manifested, and, and that's you know a, a clenched fist. I'm ready to punch somebody. I'm ready to do some damage. I, I didn't, right? But the so the so the, the 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 natural position of the hand is natural shape of the hand is open, right? So if I unfurl my fingers, if I unclench my fist, unfurl my fingers, I I have underneath that um, uh, in, in the palm of my hand, I have a, a, a glass diamond, um, and um, that is. That is the brilliance of, of, of who we are. And diamond, diamonds are the toughest things known, um, known to man or womankind, and they, they can't be scratched. So if it can't be scratched, if it can't be cut, um, there's, there's no wound, right? You can't, you, can't, you, can't, you can't scratch the diamond. And the, the metaphor, every metaphor runs out of steam, really, but... Um, you know, this this has a finite worth. It was nine pounds off Amazon as a glass diamond. If it was a diamond diamond, it'd probably be worth, I don't know, three million quid, four, four million, three and a half million dollars or whatever that is. Whatever, that's right. But the, the value of every, uh, every person's value is, is infinite. It's infinite value. We have infinite value, every every one of us. So, the for me, the the the, the thing has been separating the the trauma, um, which is the the fist, from the diamond. So, I I am the diamond. We are the diamond. Every one of us diamonds. We are not, we are not our trauma. So, separating me from my thoughts and feelings, helping people see separate themselves from their trauma from their thoughts and feelings that has been the biggest thing for mm -hmm. me so, um, yeah. it's about identity it's about who we are not what we think it's about who we are not we, what we feel it's about who we are not the trauma that we've been through yeah do you have any um closing questions for us um I think uh, I'd love to hear a bit, a, a, a bit from Kayla. I feel we've left you out a little bit. Sorry. <laughs> I, was like, I was enjoying listening to you guys. Okay. Um, so I was just thinking, I don't know, closing, but before the interview started, we were thinking about, uh, in the email, you said that if we needed something to talk about, we would talk about what came to our mind when we say thriving adoptees. And she said that implies possibility of an unthriving adoptee oh okay and that's the scary part and as not only as the birth mom but you know 
I was the daughter of a non-thriving adoptee and it wasn't very good <laughs> a lot of the time, you know what I mean? And that's what I've been thinking about. I don't know how that's a close right. statement, but I'm just thinking like that's what we're is now in our mind is how to help people not have unthriving anybody's, you know? Okay. So one of the things I'm looking at at the moment is what get, what 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 do we do that stops us thrive, thriving? Um, and I also had uh, a, the opposite take from uh, an, on an email from an adoptee last week, who said, um, uh, "I'm not doing very well at the moment. Uh, I." I, but I, uh, so I, I don't think I could come on your podcast. Um, but then again, maybe I should listen to it first. So it's a bit like the same thing with the, your Instagram followers. Like people, people, people will often comment before they've actually listened, um, and it, it, it's the wrong way around, really, for me. Is that? Um, but yeah, so thriving adoptee. It like some people won't listen to the show i got the impression that that adoptee wouldn't listen to the show so the strap the, the, it's the title is thriving adoptees and then the strap line is healing inspiration and empowerment for adoptees now for me that says what i'm trying to achieve or else i wouldn't have given me that but the the word thriving adoptee was enough to stop that person listening to the show because they I, I wanted something that was aspirational moving towards so thriving adoptee it can mean yeah there are non-thriving adoptees or it can mean I'm not I'm not thriving so I don't want to listen to the show can, human nature is a really weird thing right that we can yeah. that, that we could look at it all those different ways this is why I like hearing from so many different perspectives. And uh, like if our intro, we, if you, if anybody was to, you know, listen to it, but our intro is like, we're not just for the good or just for the bad stories. Like we want the whole ray. Yeah, we want to tell them. Yeah, we, we have no, we're not looking for a specific story. We want to hear it all because that is what adoption is is this is all yeah so thanks for inviting us to your podcast yeah, you're welcome and I, I think as I was um as you were saying that I I remembered that you know you've had Lucy Sheen on the on your podcast who's been on that and 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 her um uh, something yeah something that you said rang true for her so it was um it, it's both you know tolerance it's not all good or not all bad it, it's it, it's it's good and bad it, it, it it's we have to be comfortable with ambiguity and uh, there is no right she she you she talks as a transracial adoptee she she talks about she talks about harnessing that as a as a strength and playing to the strengths of the different part of uh, of, of her nature versus nurture and she expresses it far better than me than that, but it it it's about that. It's about both. It's not yeah, that. she was very eloquent, and I mean, I had like a lot of thoughts about it because, like, I was like, basically, adoption is like parenting in a way. Like, how do you parent? How do you cope with your children? Like, how? And it's okay not to have all the answers. It's okay to just get on her level and just be like, I understand that this is a problem for you. Yeah, and just acknowledge the feeling that they're having instead of trying to tell them what they should be feeling. Brilliant. Yeah. Brilliant. Thanks a lot, guys. And Thank uh, you. I really enjoyed it. Thank you to listeners. Uh, slightly different format. I hope you've enjoyed that. And uh, we'll speak to you again very soon. Bye-bye.